So uh, thank you, everyone. I really, that was um, really moving and inspiring. And um, I can't imagine how difficult it is to deal with such a very holistic environment that you're that you're working in. Um, so you're not only challenging systematic inequalities, but you're also trying to dismantle like deep-seated social norms, cultural norms, as well as colonial legacies in all of your interventions. And um, I was thinking if you can, each one, if each one of you can elaborate, because I'm pretty sure you've say, you've faced uh, some challenges in uh, your implementation or in your research desi design, because I understand. Um, you're in a different uh, level in your uh, community service project. Can I elaborate on one of the challenges that you think was the most challenging part in your intervention and how did you mitigate that? Um. Um, so, of course, when, as I mentioned before, when I started this project, it was so hard for me, despite not having the experience and also the resources. There was also this problem that Taliban, the, the new leader in our country, they they don't allow girls to go to educational centers, and even uh, they have the security problem that girls cannot uh, like even join online things if they know about this. So there would be problems with the girls. So I had to take the security measures, and I, I had to uh, secure their. Um, Faces like they shouldn't be shown. No one should know that they are joining our sessions and these stuffs. Um, yeah, there were many challenges, but you know that when there is people who who have been banned from education and and their own rights, so they are more uh, like relying on the outsource the sources that they have in the outside. So they, despite these problems of security and, and these things, still they were joining, they were interested. Like even in the, in the first session that we had, we had more than 80 girls joining our session, which was so much for me, for a person who, is, who has just started. So their motivation, their motivation was so much for me to be motivated and to try more, 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 for, to provide better for them, better support and stuff, yeah. So thank you so much for your question. Uh, our initial stage was researching, and obviously in Lebanon, it's not spoken about much. It's not, yeah. not enough research is done in this field of GBV. So finding data about GBV, and especially in Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon, it was tough. Uh, thankfully, we did enough research to get the data that we need in order to um, create an optimal solution. And here comes the actual solution stage, where we decided to find uh, a solution that is both tangible and has short-term impact, immediate impact, and not like awareness that takes so long to actually have a ripple effect. Um, and so we provided them with uh, self-defense classes and um, these personal alarms that we showed you, which are hopefully going to give those precious few moments to save a life. And that was basically the challenge. And we also faced a small challenge with uh, being trained and researching how to talk with potential victims in the camp uh, that we're going to be uh, training in our intervention. Thank you. Uh, I think the main challenge or the main limitations, although the, the, the pilot hasn't been uh, implemented yet, but we could, it's very obvious the limitations that could uh, that we could face. Uh, basically, in the first phase with the with the mobile clinic, it will be in collaboration with physicians, with uh, with uh, nursing, with nurses, with uh, psychologists, psychologists or psychology students. We're giving the chance to everyone to collaborate. Um, the main issue is to shift this behavior, because in Arabic, it's there's the saying that says man من something so if you're really rooted with this uh, concept in your mind and it's been for on for generations it's been since the Hammurabi code it's very hard to shift that it's very hard to bring a man or a family and sit them down and say your honor is really not related to your daughter your honor is very subjective to you so I guess uh, living in an environment whether it was in the middle region um, well middle easterns or, or north African it is um, it has to be the fact that we live in an environment that it's very um, 
let's say, they put families together, it's not individu individualistic uh, society. So everyone has control over the others. So I think that's the, the, that's the main issue, is shifting this behavior, is actually convincing people that this is wrong, and just because it has been happening for a generation doesn't mean it's right and doesn't mean it's what we're supposed to do. So I, I, I guess mainly just that. Yeah. Um, we're gonna open the floor for questions. Yes, we have one in the back. Uh, my my name is Munashe. My main question was about how do you deal with the issue of intersectionality within like the gender-based violence demographic? Because if you look at it and say we give a case of like here in Lebanon. Let's say there will be different responses between a Lebanese speak woman speaking out, a Palestinian refugee speaking out, and let's say a migrant worker who is also here was speaking out. These cases are going to be treated in very different ways. And how, how, how will you treat, deal with the, the differences in these women? That's a great question. Thank you so much. So personally, uh, our team is dealing with the Palestinian refugee camp. And thankfully, we have a Palestinian Muhammad uh, who lives right next to the camp and knows the cultural uh, and etiquette of Palestinian people. So that helped us so much with dealing uh, with people there, talking with the man about what might be happening, uh, collecting uh, information from NGOs who specifically work with these camps. Uh, on how to handle the situation, how to collect information, how to uh, create an optimal solution. And so it really depends on the organizations who have previous experience with these camps and also the psychiatrist we talked about who um, has so many cases of gender-based violence in Palestinian refugee camps. So all of this research and networking and partnerships help a lot. And of course, they don't, they're going to differ from a camp to another and a culture to another. Great, I think we can take one more question. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so actually I just wanna pick up on something Marwa mentioned, but also the other presenters, sorry, I, I didn't fully memorize the names, I apologize. Um, and I think it goes to the question of normalization and what I felt was common for all three was the denormalization, right? And I know I know this is way beyond the scope of what you can do or what you, you know, what one can do. But just following up, how do you envision with these kind of projects, whether it's providing this, you know, very safe space for offering educational opportunities for young girls in Afghanistan online, or whether, you know, addressing GBV in 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 um refugee camps or getting us out of this horrific uh, tunnel of honor uh, killings, right? As you mentioned, it's a cultural thing, right? And it keeps revisiting. And I think it was a slide of the relapse. Here we go again, right? So how do we how do we envision, and I know, sorry, if I'm, I, I'm definitely throwing too much on you, but how can we start, we collectively, thinking of denormalization, this utter abnormalities, uh, you know, down the line? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, okay, so I will start with the part I remember <laughs> the question. Uh, of course, it's hard to de like challenge the situation that is currently going on, but it's not something that I can do it alone. Of course, it's not something that anyone can do it alone, and it's not something that you can change in a moment like this, or it's not ch something that you can change even in a year because. It's it's been there. It's coming again and again and again. So accepting this wouldn't change anything. We should start at some point. There need to be a start point for someone. I wanted to do this as start, and there are many other people who want to do this as start. And I forgot the second part of the question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. It is. And uh, just as I said, I just started by them getting this education. You know, these girls, they don't know about your rights. 
th th there's a lot of problem within the, there. Even when I implement my projects, I don't say psychosocial support because in our country, if you say like we are bringing psychologists, we are speaking about psychosocial supports, their only mindset is just only the crazy people go to the psychologist, nothing else. So I title my projects in another way. I title my workshops in another way for them to come in, share their stories, brainstorm the problems, solve these in another title. So I, I may do it in another way, but finally the same, it's the same route. They will have the same support. And maybe one day they will know that this psychosocial support is not for, for crazy people or for people who have mind problem. It's for everyone. We all need this solution. We all need, need this support. So just as I said, it's just a start. And I'm going on with it until I have this breathtaking. Yeah. OK, so that's a very interesting question. Thank you. And I agree with everything our colleague said. And I'd like to add that while our intervention focuses on women and how they can defend themselves in stressful situations, we cannot drive the attention away from men, from the abusers themselves. So uh, my opinion is that we should hold men accountable. Always speak up. You guys stayed here for this panel, meaning that you have awareness of a problem, a huge problem that needs to be solved. And how can you solve it? Stand out, speak out for women, even though you don't know them. Share the news about uh, the heartbreaking incidents that are happening when, wherever you see them. You can make a difference. Even one click, one like, one share could make a difference. And even if you don't know the person, it could happen to anyone. It could happen to you, to your mother, to your daughter, whatever. It could happen to anyone. And yeah, basically protest. Thank you. So to answer your question, Dr. Henning, um, I think what my colleagues so far and I have mentioned is just the tip of the iceberg. Because uh, again, there a lot of cases are goes under, not reported. So I think one of the things that we can do collectively is actually report, start with reporting and raising their voices that this woman has been killed for a reason. And the whole process of denormalizing is it can take generations actually for it to be able to happen. But I think raising awareness about this issue and say like showing to people that this is not the right thing to do uh, by throwing campaigns, by, uh, you know, college students going around in rural areas explaining to people that uh, this is not the right this is not the right thing to do we might get you know kicked out from that rural area the first the second time but we will be eventually heard and um, in Algeria actually from the 1990s all the way to the 2000s there was something called the black decade you know the black decade where the terrorists were mainly killing women if you're a woman walking with your hair down you know you're automatically getting killed and what led to that happening? There was a lot of marches of people going out saying that this is not the regime that we want to follow. This is not what we, this is not the type of country that we want to live in. And uh, I'm not saying Algeria is a perfect country right now, but they don't have terrorists. And if you go around with your hair down, we still have the issue of, you know, uh, harassment and everything, but you're, it, you're not getting that bullet in your head anymore. So I think as collectively, we can, if we can march for, uh, for in order to kick a president out, we can also march for honor killing and we can also march for women's rights. So instead of March 8 inviting me to go receive a flower or a piece of cake and then you go and you beat me in the house, that's not how I want to be celebrated on March 8. On March 8, I want to go out, I want to speak about the law that you're allowing these people, or you're allowing my rapist to marry me and get away with his sentence. Um, I got really enthusiastic about it. So yeah, <laughs> let's all raise our voices and speak Very about this issue. <laughs> Hi, thank you for being with us today and uh, thank you for uh, projecting these wonderful ideas. Uh, I'm still a student in school and I see here next to you guys. And just to add on to the previous question, uh, we always hear talk about gender roles in school now. Uh, but it's all just talk. We never really go and do actions. So just us as uh, the new ge generation kind of, what can we do more than just raise awareness? How can we help? Uh, where, where can we go? Mm -hmm. 
So you're talking about gender roles as in future careers for women versus men, yeah. right? Yeah, this is okay. one of the So what you can do as students, don't think about yourself as young, as not having potential, yeah. You can make a difference. You, I've seen high schoolers, middle schoolers, starting organizations, starting initiatives that help women break into men careers, um, STEM, whatever, engineering. So you can do this too. Even if you want to just participate in such events, not actually initiate them, you can do that. Go out, speak about them, start an Instagram page maybe, encouraging and empowering women, uh, letting them realize they have so much more potential. That would be more than enough. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. In your school, you can start a workshop with your colleagues and you know, you take permission from the administration and then just um, introduce this topic to your peers. Start with your small circle and then it, the, if the impact goes larger and larger. Okay, okay yes, thank you. Great, thank you everyone. Um,